Welcome to the Energy Futures Lab and IDLS program event, where we'll be discussing alternative large scale energy storage options, looking beyond batteries and pumped hydro. So for those of you joining us for the first time, Energy Futures Lab is one of seven global institutes at Imperial College London. It was established in 2005 to address the world's major energy challenges by bringing together teams from all over the college with a variety of research backgrounds to carry out multidisciplinary and high impact research. Hosted within the Energy Futures Lab is the IDLS program. That stands for the Integrated Development of Low Carbon Energy Systems. And that's a five year EPSSC funded initiative centered around whole energy systems analysis. So today's session will start with a presentation from Professor Christos Marquides, who describes the principles behind and latest developments in storage technologies based on thermomechanical principles. He'll draw on a recent online feature he and his team wrote for the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and a comprehensive review of the topic he and colleagues published last year. We'll then bring in three of our excellent external panelists and we had two to three minutes response from each of them on this topic. We'll then open the discussion and take questions from the audience for about 20 minutes or so. Please submit questions through the Q&A feature in Teams as the event progresses. We'll only be able to address a handful of them, so please read the questions already submitted. And if they're ones you want the panel to discuss, please like them. Finally, this event is being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. I'm now going to hand over to Christos to get us started. He's the Professor of Clean Energy Technologies in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Imperial College. He's a project lead in the IDLS program and responsible for the work package characterizing energy technologies from a whole system perspective. He's also the group leader of the Clean Energy Processes Lab. Christos, over to you. Thank you, Nile. I will share my presentation. OK, uh, Nile, can you just confirm that you can see everything and we're good to go? Yep, we're good to go. All right, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so welcome everyone to this uh, presentation, which sort of focuses on um, large scale energy storage. Um, and I think what I'm going to try to do today is not necessarily say anything too controversial. I think most people who are attending this um, workshop or panel uh, you know, we'll we'll appreciate that energy storage will will be needed as we <clears throat> as our energy system uh, develops into the future. Um, but what I want to do is to try to sort of present a few alternatives to what most people would associate with electricity storage. So most people will be familiar with batteries or electrochemical storage of that nature. And most people uh, or many people might also be familiar with pumped hydro. Um, I'm not um, going to say that these technologies are not useful, that they won't play a role. Uh, not at all. Um, in fact, they will play a very significant role. I just think that um, it, it is a, these are more familiar technologies. So I just wanted to explore with my team a few alternative options and I'll explain um, what the advantages or what the role of those options might be. So I only have one slide on this because I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, in most um, projections um, <clears throat> for the evolution of electricity and energy systems, if we're going to decarbonize, you will have a very significant penetration of renewables into the grid here. We can see something from the IEA on the right hand side. Uh, and you can see the huge increase over the next few decades of things like wind, solar and some other renewables. And one of the characteristics of renewables is that they are variable. Some people refer to this as intermittency. Um, so one of the enabling uh, technologies or, or aspects of an energy system, if it's going to absorb this level of renewables, uh, is flexibility or energy storage. So um, I think most people, I think, will, will be happy with this conclusion that we need affordable, reliable and secure electricity supply. And for this, we require storage which is an imperative component of these pathways for transition of energy systems. So I only have one slide on pumped hydro. Again, it's not that pumped hydro is not important. It should um, and will play a role. It is already playing a role. It is the only established and widely used thermomechanical, mechanical, uh, I should say, uh, storage technology. Um, it, we have a lot of experience with this technology uh, and there are plans to launch new pumped hydro plants 
Um, there is one disadvantage that has to do with geographical restrictions. Uh, we don't need to go into it for now. Uh, it's suffice to say that this is a useful technology, but we want to explore alternatives. I also won't go into great length um, on electrochemical storage, so you know, batteries. Um, these have attracted and continue to attract very significant funding, attention. The costs of these technologies have been dropping at a very fast rate over recent decades. Um, there are some restrictions to what they can do, of course. Uh, they typically not suited for longer duration storage. So when we want to store something for <clears throat> days or weeks, <clears throat> which you know might be uh, an, uh, increasingly a, a, an issue for the for the system. Um, so they're not particularly, you know, they wouldn't be the, the lower hanging fruit for, for that type of uh, application. They also have relatively short lifetime. So typically a, a, a battery, a lithium ion battery would last two, three, four years. It depends on how you use it and a few hundred cycles, right? And you will see later on that some of the technologies I'm talking about today are capable of lasting beyond 10,000 cycles. Um, there are some uh, electrochemical technologies that are now um, gaining traction because they have longer life cycles and they can they are more uh, suited to these uh, grid uh, applications, but they are still at early stage of development. So yes, there's a lot of happening here, but we are going to discuss something else. Um, we are going to discuss and focus on okay, what I, is available at the grid scale, right? for time shifting over significantly long duration, so longer than what we would associate with, say, lithium ion batteries, so days, weeks, but also at very large scales, right? So tens, hundreds of megawatts, hours, and so on. Um, so what is available? Well, we are going to discuss something that is referred to as thermomechanical energy storage. This is a, basically an umbrella term for a number of technologies that we're going to present very briefly. Um, and in these technologies, essentially what happens is electrical energy is transformed to either mechanical and or thermal energy, which is then stored and then recovered later when um, the electrical energy is needed. So there are conversion processes that take place between electricity and mechanical work and heat or cold. Uh, one of the good things about thermomechanical energy um, storage technologies is that typically, not, not uh, everything, but most components in these um, technologies are relatively established. There are things we know and understand very well. Uh, they exist in power plants and other um, technologies out there and, and, and um, they're established uh, components and we know and have experience with these components and they can last decades. And as I said before, <clears throat> two orders of magnitude more in terms of the number of cycles that they could do before end of life. Um, <coughs> so. These technologies are still at an early stage of development. They are in a very different stage of development depending on which one. But I'm going to try to convince you today that they do show some competitive technical and economic characteristics, right? When we're looking at this larger scale and longer duration electricity storage. So one slide of sort of focusing our discussion a little bit, I, I kind of mentioned it, but I think this, this slide is quite useful. So on the horizontal axis, you can see uh, the power requirements. So these are electricity storage applications, right? So there's a power requirement going from a few tens of kilowatts all the way up to 100 megawatts. Um, and then there's a the storage duration or time, which goes from um, milliseconds, minutes to hundreds, thousands of minutes. So we are going to be focusing typically, right? There is a, there are two types of application, short duration storage, typically this is referred to as power management, right? And then the longer duration storage, a few minutes, hours, days, weeks, and upwards. So you can see that top part of this, this chart, and that's where we're going to be focusing. Uh, and this is where thermomechanical energy storage systems, I believe, can find an application. And if you look at, this is a very similar chart, by the way, on the left hand, you can see the, the, the vertical axis, we have a, a power rating. So you can see tens of megawatts, hundreds of megawatts and storage of hours, days. Uh, you can see hundreds of hours, thousands of hours. So if you look at this map of available technologies and, um, and where they sit on this map and you focus on the top right hand side of this plot, which is really what, what we said we would try to do, um, you see three types of technologies that, that come to the fore. Of course, there are many of them and we don't have time to do justice to all of them, but I selected three which are the most 
common. There's something that's referred to as compressed air energy storage. There's liquid air energy storage, and we have a panelist from Highview uh, with us to tell us even more about that. And we have pump thermal electricity storage that I had personally a, a slight involvement in. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have a couple of slides on each one. But before I do, I wanted to uh, make a point, which I'll come to a little bit later, which is that underneath each one of these headings, right? So I, whether it's compressed air, liquid air, pump thermal, actually there is a, a large variation. There's a variability of options that we can have. Um, and I'll talk very briefly about these. Again, th there's no time to go into the details, but I think it's important to appreciate that there isn't a single monolithic version of each one of these options. There are many, many different configurations and uh, conditions and operational and, and sort of design variations that we can have. So let's start from compressed air. Um, here you can see an existing plant. There are two plants. Uh, this is a relatively old one that goes back to the late 70s, uh, which is installed in, um, in Germany. It's a 300 megawatt uh, plant, two hours of storage. Um, this particular plant doesn't have a very good efficiency, but it, it's, it's an old technology. It's, it's established when they stand it reasonably well. Um, what do we have in this particular type of system? Well, <clears throat> what we do is we use electricity um, to compress air and to store this air. And then at the late, at a high pressure, of course, and then at the later time, we have high pressure air, which has some form of, let's say, potential energy, and then we can expand this. Um, so we run what I said in reverse, we can expand it through turbines and we can get the electricity back and we can exhaust the air. Now, there are a number of variations to this, as I said before. Um, there's something called the abatic compressed energy storage, where <clears throat> we basically reject the heat of compression, because as you can imagine, when we compress air, it gets hot. Um, this results in an efficiency penalty, so we lose some energy. That heat is a uh, useful energy to us, which we lose, um, which is where uh, the abatic compressed energy storage comes in, um, which is a, a simple principle in which we effectively try to uh, not only store the compressed air, but we store this heat of compression that we then use later to increase our round trip efficiency. And there are isothermal, isobaric versions of this technology where we try to perform the compression and expansion in specific ways that might offer us thermodynamic or cost advantages. Again, we don't have time to go into the details. I think the main um, point I'm trying to get across here is that there are various options of this technology um, underneath the heading of compressed air. Uh, let's go to liquid air. So the principal commercial entity which is you know, uh, commercializing this technology is Habi Power in the UK. Um, you can see here their 350 kilowatt, I think it's around seven hours of storage pilot plant in Greater Manchester. There are some very nice pictures of this online that you can find on Highview Power's website. The basic principle here, again, is relatively simple. When we have excess electricity on the grid, uh, we can run a liquefaction process. So we run a process <clears throat> by which we effectively liquefy air. We take air at uh, normal conditions and we cool it so it becomes a liquid. We can store this um, at low pressure, which is one of the advantages. Uh, and then at a later time, we can take this uh, liquid air, and we can expand it. You can see here, right, to recover the electricity when it is needed. Um, now, this is, as I said, it's a very simple description of the con on the concept. In reality, there are many, many uh, more things and, and an added complexity that you can have. You can see here already there are some additional arrows uh, and elements to this type of system that you can have. Yes, um, th these are there to off to. Uh, offer uh, advantages, for example, in terms of increased round trip efficiency and so on. Uh, but the concept remains the same. It is we take electricity, we cryogenically um, produce liquid air, we store the liquid air, and then at a later time we expand this uh, and we get the power back when we need it. Um, and then the third type of, um, let's say, thermomechanical and electricity storage system I wanted to speak about very briefly is something called pump thermal electricity storage. So this is a technology that um, I have a few uh, companies that have been looking at this on the next slide, I think. Um, but there has also been a, a very significant UK uh, effort in this direction. So there was a company that went into administration a few years back called Isentropic. 
uh, that was developing this technology. Um, they never really tested their demonstrator, which was bought by Newcastle. I think they're in the final stages of running this demonstrator. Uh, but you can see here the rating and one of the specific, um, let's say, innovations of the isentropic version of pump thermal electricity storage were these uh, very special compressors and expanders. Uh, and I'm going to explain now what pump thermal electricity storage is. So what we do here is when we have electricity, we can use these compressors to compress a fluid. So typically uh, it could be argon or some other type of fluid. Commonly it's argon. Um, and when we compress this gas, of course, it gets hot, so we can store this heat. And this is where electricity gets transformed to heat. Heat gets stored. Um, this type of cycle is called a, a heat pump cycle. So we, we use electricity to pump heat into some storage, um, some store, excuse me. Um, it also generates a cold effect at the same time. So we're storing hot and cold at the same time. And then at the later time, we can use the fact that we have uh, a hot store and a cold store <clears throat> to run a thermodynamic power cycle, which is basically the reverse. We reverse this cycle to get the power when we need it. Uh, as you can imagine, there are, again, similar to the ones that I spoke about, a number of versions of this. We can have closed cycles, open cycles. There are a number of uh, different types of thermal energy storage. Uh, units that we can have. They could be packed beds like the one that I showed you before from Isentropic. They could be, uh, the heat could be stored in the form of a liquid, either cold or hot. And we can have different technologies for the compressors and expanders. As I said before, Isentropic's technology was, had this very specific positive displacement piston uh, expander and compressor, which could be reversed. Um, but in any case, there are, there are many, many versions of, of this type of technology. And the last thing I would say very quickly is that there is something called the chest concept where instead of uh, running a, a heat pump, as I said before, so similar to, to the pump thermal electricity store, instead of running a, 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 a argon or a, a, some sort of gas um, to compress and expand when we want to get either heat or electricity, what we do here is we run something called a, a, a steam ranking cycle, which is what we use in conventional power stations. So again, forward and reverse. So now I want to show you some uh, comparisons that we did. Uh, we had a particular interest with, a, you can see here, some of my collaborators in doing a, a fair comparison between these technologies. Uh, and the way that we tried to do that was to try to develop a, a unified framework for the modeling and the prediction of their efficiency and cost. So in this paper, um, which uh, you, can, you can download, it's, it's open access. We tried to look at large scale long duration systems. So we designed a range of systems. You can see here going from a few megawatts up to hundreds of megawatts, 300 megawatts um, of the various options that I described before. So a few compressed air systems, liquid air and, and different types of pump thermal uh, with relatively long duration time. So for a few hours to a few days up to in excess of 100 hours, you can see there for the uh, liquid air and storage system. and given the sort of the modeling framework that we had developed with a common set of assumptions and methodologies we tried to predict the route efficiency of each one plus we tried to predict the costs now uh, don't worry i know that from the table it's very difficult to do any comparisons so i'm going to come to this in a minute but i just wanted to show you that um, using a sort of a unified approach we tried to predict technical performance so something like a round trip efficiency for different designs over different scales of these types of systems and uh, to compare their costs. And we use two cost metrics, the power capital cost and the energy capital cost. And I'll show you these in a second, but before I do very quickly, the round trip efficiency, we don't have major variations between the different options. They're a little bit lower than pumped hydro and the sort of electrochemical storage options, but not by much. And I might say something controversial, and I'll be happy for the panel to discuss this later, but I don't believe that round trip efficiency is um, the principal driver for the selection of these types of technologies. I will tell you what I think is the principal driver. I think cost is the principal driver. And you can see on these plots, comparisons of different options. Uh, you can see in blue, um, compressed air, either in salt caverns or in pressure vessels. Liquid air is the yellow. Uh, red is pump thermal, as is uh, this golden color. 
uh, depending on how you're storing it, a liquid tank or packed beds and chest is the green, the green trigles. And you can see here in some cases, very, very significant uh, differences between the power capital cost and the energy capital cost. And of course, what you're looking for here is something which is quite low. Compressed air comes out to be a relatively uh, low cost option. However, uh, in the compressed air versions that you can see right at the bottom, so these uh, circles, we're using salt caverns. And salt caverns bring with them constraints, geographical constraints. And what this really means is um, if we have those constraints, and so this option at the bottom is no longer available, then we need to look at some of these other either pump thermal or liquid air options. And you can see there that the actual comparisons are, are very close. Some of those technologies are very close, especially at the sort of the lower end over here where they start to overlap. So it's very difficult from these types of plots to understand, let's say, what the better uh, option is. Um, so um, one last point uh, is that an advantage of thermomechanical energy storage options is that, of course, they have embedded within them flows of heat and cold, right, which is part of the operation of the system. Now, this also means that they can integrate with external heat sources. And this is very useful because they this can affect the economics of these types of systems very significantly. Um, so I would uh, conclude this slide and then I'll go to the next one, which is my last one, I think, um, that if we can find applications where thermomechanical energy storage uh, is co-located with either so it's an, a, an end user, say an industrial plant or something else that has a demand for heat or cold or has waste heat or cold, then the, the preference for this type of technology becomes even greater. Whoops, sorry, next one. And this is my final slide. So, so far I was just showing you some comparisons of these technologies at the level of the technology itself. In reality, what we need to consider is the value that electricity storage can offer to the whole system. And we have done an effort. Um, I'm giving a reference and I'll leave it on the reference slide in a minute if you're interested in this. So we've done um, a specific uh, dedicated study to look at what value uh, technologies like pump thermal or liquid air can have um, in the context of the decarbonization of the whole UK electricity system. Um, and there are some very, very interesting conclusions from that, not necessarily unexpected, uh, but uh, the first very significant change that happens in the way that the uh, grid decarbonizes in these projections is that there's a significantly reduced CCS capacity requirement um, because of essentially a, a very, very significant increase in the penetration of renewables and specifically PV in the south and wind in the north. Um, and then, of course, a reduction in requirements for peaking generation capacity. Uh, and this is effectively a consequence of the fact that as we increase the penetration of these types of technologies into the grid, of course, they offer flexibility and therefore peaking generation capacity uh, can be reduced. So um, it's only at this uh, whole system level that we can really understand um, the importance that these technologies can have to the grid. And you can see here on the right hand side, the, I would say, five or six fold increase, right, in, in, um, in renewable capacity and reduction in, in, in say, things like uh, OCGTs and, and uh, gas CCS uh, that we have in the grid. So very, very different uh, grids, let's say, if, if these technologies are present. Okay, so I'm going to close my presentation. Um, I'm a few minutes over, but sorry about that. But um, I, I believe that there is a role for thermomechanical um, electricity storage technologies. Uh, we still need research and development. My personal opinion is that um, efficiency is not so much an issue as is cost. So we need to focus on cost reduction. I should say cost reduction at the system level can come at uh, can, can arise <clears throat> from either a reduction in the cost of components, new components, or higher performance components. Okay, so higher performance components can in some cases lead to lower costs. Um, and we need some uh, components in some cases which are uh, less common. So there are reversible components that are required, for example, in pump thermal. Um, and so there's a lot of interest there in experimental testing of specific components which have uh, a role in determining the cost and performance of these technologies. 
Um, these are some references. I'm going to leave it there um, just for a few seconds because I think this is being recorded. Thank you very much. I'll pass it back to Nile and the panel. Thank you for your attention. Great. Krista, thank you very much. Very interesting. And we're now going to move to the panel session. So I'm going to introduce our three external panelists who are kind enough to join us today and we'll hear some remarks from them on this topic. So first of all, we're joined by Stuart Nelmers. He's an engineering director at Highview Power. Highview is a long duration energy storage pioneer, so very appropriate for, of course, today's discussion. They specialize in cryogenic energy storage. As engineering director, Stuart is responsible for the company's engineering and related development activity, including the delivery of the Pillsworth commercial demonstration plant. That is a five megawatt, 15 megawatt hour liquid air energy storage plant, and it's the first, the world's first grid scale liquid air energy storage plant. Joining us today, we also have Dr. Nina Skorupska. She's the chief executive of the Association for Renewable Energy and Clean Technology. The REA is the largest renewable energy and associated clean energy technology body in the UK. It has about 500 member organizations. Prior to joining the RA in 2013, Nina worked for 20 years in the RWE group across fuel engineering and R&D, power station operations and trading. And finally, I welcome Darren Jones, who's a technology manager at Hitachi Energy, which was previously Hitachi ABB Power Grids and before that ABB. He's responsible for promoting Hitachi Energy's technology portfolio into the UK electricity transmission and distribution utilities and understanding and influencing the future direction of UK electricity network development. So these are three people very well placed to share their perspectives and contribute to today's discussion. So I'm going to first turn to Stuart and uh, we'll hear his remarks. So over to you, Stuart. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, firstly, uh, really interesting presentation and uh, thanks, Christoph. Um, I, I think, you know, just building on really what, what Christoph and his team had, have um, put together, the um, you can see obviously the the marketplace um, at the moment is 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 really a hotbed of uh, new technologies, particularly in the you know the uh, thermomechanical. Um, I think what's important um, and it in, is in, indicative in the in the presentation is just the the sort of wider set of services that um, these sort of technologies um, can provide. Um, as you saw on some of the earlier slides, the um, the the storage or the services storage can provide and is required is is a complex mix um, and I think that's important that it requires a mix of technologies um, and uh, thermomechanical technologies will undoubtedly play um, play a role in this a very important role in this and it will be a mix of those technologies so it's important that we could keep the funding um, and the progression of those so that we can ensure that they're ready for when the real um, you know, uh, demand and problem occurs, which, you know, is 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 getting ever closer, particularly with um, the world climate as it is at the moment. So. Market mechanisms to allow that to happen and education within that market so that people understand that, you know, the way in which you um, need to assess these technologies is not a straight energy shifting. It's much more than that. It's stability services. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, integration with other uh, maybe heating industries and other other points like that, which which Christoph was was highlighting. Um, and I'd, I'd pass on to um, Nina now, um, you know, um, I'm looking forward to the dis discussion. Thanks, over to you, Nina. Hi, everybody, and thanks for inviting me to join in, in this session. And thank you, Christoph, for that. Um, really, I learned something new a little bit more, even as an engineer and a scientist. Um, it's great to hear of the work and the comparisons of bringing sense making to these uh, very important technologies. Um, as the REA, you know, we've represented renewable energy and the, the classic, as you said, Christos, was uh, solar and wind. And if I have to listen one more time, to somebody in the House of Commons or an MP talk about when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, this is why we shouldn't pursue renewables. I think we've scotched that completely now because these technologies are burgeoning and are, are there ready to support the further penetration of renewables. And as Stuart has also said, um, 
it isn't just about the easy story about time shifting of the energy from solar and uh, to cover peaks and things like this. It is the huge bundle. And for me, the, the winning category uh, service is to avoid the curtailing of the valuable renewable power uh, in terms of the economics of, of further investments into renewables. The REA thinks this is such an important topic that uh, when we launched um, our uh, membership forums for energy storage, of course, it started with focusing on batteries and, and seeing those amazing costs coming down. But we were produced a report ourselves with our members uh, back in 2020 um, to highlight all of these cases. And that was more about what are the policies, what are the market mechanisms to make the, these technologies really be um, uh, adopted. And we're pleased to say that with all of those efforts and your good efforts too, and uh, other colleagues here, that the government is really beginning to listen funds are being made available is enough going into new energy storage technologies which we know 6.7 million has been committed under the innovation portfolio fund probably not in my book not when we see you know that um, 180 million is going into nuclear innovation and so on and so forth so of course i'm going to be a bit biased towards renewables and clean tech like uh, energy storage but I'm interested to be part of the conversation and yourselves to look at what those market constructs to make these technologies fly and also to look at um, what are the policy and regulations and those geological and geographical constraints that you've highlighted as well. Thank you. Over to me. Thanks, Thank Nina. Over to you, Darren. Yes, sorry, Darren, uh, I should have introduced uh, you. Are you OK? Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Nina. And thanks, Neil. Um, great, great presentation. Great to hear some of the investigations being done there. I have to say, but perhaps uh, we didn't rehearse this, uh, but uh, Neil and Stuart covered perhaps some of the points that I would have made anyway <laughs> regarding the kind of takeaways from the presentation. Um, but just a few broad observations. I mean, uh, you know, it's important to say that Hitachi Energy doesn't actually have a specific interest in long duration storage. Um, kind of our portfolio solutions at the moment are more based on um, you know, the traditional kind of, as we know, existing technology, um, short duration type storage, you know, some of our portfolio quite heavily focused on the control and SCADA systems for short duration storage, which, as we know, is, as Christos described really well, kind of lithium ion battery systems for small, um, small scale grid edge type projects and grid, uh, grid scale ancillary service type developments. But, you know, it's absolutely clear that we all know all of these areas are heavily interconnected and um, the areas where Hitachi Energy does have a strong interest, things like HVDC, um, substation interconnectors absolutely need long duration storage to be a success to make sure we can bring this whole range of different technology solutions to deliver that future net zero energy system that, you know, is more important than ever now. Um, I think I recall reading somewhere recently that about 50 years ago, um, electricity delivered just 10% of final energy use to society, which has increased to around 20% now. And as we move to a net zero system, uh, we may need up to at least 130 gigawatts of offshore wind and significant amounts of solar and onshore wind. Um, and as Christos highlighted really well, it's clear that any and all pathways that lead to that future net zero energy system uh, will include both long duration and short duration storage, which is absolutely going to have to play um, absolutely key role. And I'm thinking other important elements of this research uh, for me into the economics of long duration storage is the, uh, the realisation of the practical constraints now being felt across supply chains for uh, particularly batteries but also the materials that go up to make those current technology systems, you know, the economics of, of today's approaches are changing around us. So we absolutely need new insights, new technology solutions, you know, using novel approaches to solving the storage challenge. And really key, I think the bit that Stuart brought in about the complexities of some of the, um, some of the ways people can make money off storage and the interplay between some of those balancing and ancillary markets and using storage of flexibility. So it's absolutely key, key investigation, I think. 
Um, and again, for me, it's, you know, it's really about the economics. I was really interested in Christos's slide into uh, the economics of the different technology approaches. I think it was slide eight showing the potential of the different technology discharge time against energy. Um, then a bit later on showing the, the techno-economic comparison of different approaches to the challenges is, is really important as, uh, you know, one thing I've learned as technology managers, uh, it's not actually a problem of technology that needs to be solved. Um, it's really a problem of getting the right investments into the right place. So for me, it's great to see this uh, this investigation being carried out. Equally as important, the demonstration projects being built, uh, you know, so we can begin to take the theory off the desktops and into the real world. Um, I think it's only when we have the, that real data experience combined with the, the research described today that we will be able to know which solutions are, are the winners and losers and which technologies will form part of the the long term energy system investment and strategy that, that we desperately so need for the UK. So that's probably enough for me, Neil, I think. Great, thank you very much. No, that's that's very interesting. So now we have an opportunity to to look at the questions from our audience. So for the audience, please continue to look at the existing questions. We've got quite a few out there, and and like the ones that you would like answered, because we're going to go in preference of of the ones with the most thumbs up. So I'll kick off with 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 one, which is what makes PTS LAES so much more expensive per kilowatt or per kilowatt hour compared to lithium ion battery storage. And what specific developments need to happen for higher performance or lower cost components? Crystal, maybe that's for you to kick off. So where where do the high costs come from and how, how can they be reduced? Yeah, <coughs> sorry. So uh, t t well, it depends a little bit on the on the technology. It's, it's very difficult to answer in one go, but um, typically the compressors and expanders um, will, will be quite costly components. Um, I would say that one of the very interesting characteristics of, of thermomechanical systems is that they benefit very strongly from economies of scale. Um, so what this really means is they suffer from economies of scale when you try to go small, but equally um, costs naturally um, get, get significantly smaller as the scale of the system gets larger. So I think that that's one of the reasons why these type these types of systems really uh, come into their own when when you're you know you're trying to install you know hundreds of megawatts uh, systems at at the grid scale. So naturally, the technology itself um, you know it plays to the strengths of of the economies of scale of the components that exist. But yes, the the answer to your question is it depends a little bit on the technology. Uh, in in the technologies where there are some special components that still need development, for example, I'll just say one, which is pump thermal, um, then you know the, the cost will arise from those reciprocating or or other types of components that need to be reversed as part of the operation of the system. So that requires some some additional R and D. Thank you. Um, I think we'll move to the next question because I can see quite a few. Um, which is how do you see thermomechanical energy storage lining up with green hydrogen? Maybe Stuart, you want to think about that, whether it's complementary, whether there are any synergies or they're just alternative energy storage. Um, yeah, um, in terms of synergies, um, I, I think they're basically limited, um, but but certainly, you know, as I was sort of indicating before, and, and I think Christoph's uh, um, uh, presentation also picked up on it that you know it's it's a complex mix of services that are required there's and it's a huge challenge you know uh, the the levels of storage i you know that are required globally to to go completely carbon zero right over to the renewables is is massive um and it won't be solved by any one technology um Green hydrogen will play um, a, a vital role, particularly with transportation and heating, I think. Um, but there's still a requirement for the longer duration thermomechanical systems, um, you know, on, on the base load, on the stability services, particularly in the, the more, um, uh, you know, the older networks that you're dealing with. Um, taking off large rotating machinery, which obviously there's synergies with a lot of the, the, the turbo machinery that comes with the uh, thermomechanical 
systems. So, you know, it's it's a mix um, and they're definitely complementary. Um, although the, you know, the direct uh, the, um, synergies are limited. Nina, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. It's a question I get asked an awful lot. Um, you can't see, but my jumper I've got on has got an anthesan just here. There you go. Um, and that's to emphasize like the hive behind me. We need it all. Um, and usually um, people who are fans of one particular technology will be in that camp and then explain why theirs is much better than everybody else's. And uh, we have to get past that point. And that's where as a trade association, we, we bring the and in there and talk to government around what are the horses for courses. Of course, um, as you make the case for new nuclear, for instance, just imagine how challenged those nuclear plant, which may not be as flexible, although I understand, you know, that's the ambition of the nuclear sector, the role that what are they going to do in the summer when they need to be backed off, when we are inundated with solar? And, and that's not just a UK issue, that's going to be a, a world issue as solar is also a key component of that. So the case making there from the nuclear sector is that they'll be there to to make green hydrogen. In fact, I don't call them the colours anymore. I call it net zero hydrogen. Otherwise, why are you making it in the first place? Um, so that, that's just a little pet thing for me. Um, so exactly like Stuart says, we need um, other forms of energy vectors uh, for heat and transport. And we're exploring, you know, where and how hydrogen maybe can be stored as ammonia. Uh, but my one query in all of that as a as an engineer myself is, you know, what we told about the round trip efficiency and therefore ultimately how does that impact the costs? So I like to keep it simple and mainly because I am a little bit uh, straightforward like that. And so do government officials. They like to be able to explain quite straightforwardly what it is, what it will do, how much will it cost, how reliable, what's the risk? And therefore, that's the case making for longer duration energy storage of these technologies. We need to make them stand on their own two feet. Great, thank you. So we'll move to the next one, which is about the business model, and it's how much of the revenue stack, and I presume that's from the energy storage, is assumed to be from the power component, and how much from the heat or cold component? So I guess, Stuart, maybe that's a good one for you because that will relate to your financial model. So in terms of the, the revenue that you're gaining from employing this technology. OK, um, I'm uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I, I will um, answer anyway. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the way the revenue models and um, uh, are calculated is effectively um, AC to AC, so electricity in to electricity out, it's very much a black box. So, um, you know, from a business case, um, you know, the accountants don't need to know about uh, the springs and levers and heat transfer. Um, so energy required to charge that device and then the energy you get out at a later, a later time phase. Um, and it's as simple as that. So all the heat transfer, cold transfer, you know, these are, as Nina was suggesting, it's standalone device. It's like a battery. Um, it just has, uh, you know, large rotating machinery in it. It has heat exchangers. It has um, heat sinks and, and all that. But it's all taken into account within that RTE and within that performance figure. Um, and yeah, it's as simple as that. Great. Nice and clear. Thank you. I've got one here which I think is, is a good one for Darren, which is that business models all seem to assume that intermittent electricity will be free. We've had that many times, of course. But with so many actors and technologies appearing and contracts running for years, won't it come to intermittent electricity buying auctions, which might end up them being more expensive than, than just being free, as, as we sort of imagine it today? So we've got a, an interesting circularity there. Yeah, so I mean, Darren, what do you think about that? It's a good question. It's all kind of speculation, I guess, isn't it? I don't think we actually know yet, which is why I think this this work is so important. You know, again, back to the economics. Uh, but 
there's so many different drivers and factors you know i mean the distribution companies doing an awful lot on kind of flexibility markets now new flexibility markets um you know so i think just knowing what's happening knowing where and when the intermittency is you know having that kind of better surveillance of what the energy networks are actually doing and taking all those different energy vectors um, you know, I think it's all going to help form that opinion uh, in the end. I mean, I really like the you know piece on kind of green hydrogen and what does that mean? Um, you know, I mean, maybe slightly digressing away from the question, but you know, there's a big move now which uh, Touch Energy is involved with. Lots of thinking. You know, I know Neela, you're involved in this in the uh, the proposed offshore network on the east coast of the UK. The belief at some point we'll have so much um, wind, so diverse wind across, you know, around the coast of the UK. I mean, you know, what will intermittency really, really look like? And, um, you know, I think we obviously need to change our behaviour towards how we use energy. You know, we've seen that in the short term with the kind of domestic, um, you know, the financial crisis around domestic energy bills now and how that will surely lead to, you know, the, a change in the way people use energy. And, you know, we can also see, you know, the ultimate vision for um, electric vehicles, if we can get the infrastructure built around electric vehicle charging. You now, I don't actually see a challenge with intermittency personally. If we can get electric vehicles, uh, the right infrastructure built in the right time scale, you know, then um, my belief is there'll be enough energy to, you know, to power those vehicles, use the vehicles for periods when we don't have as much renewable energy use green hydrogen to fill the gaps and some of the longer duration storage that um, Christos has touched on. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think the in intermittency market may be a short term solution to to longer term problems that might not manifest themselves. And, you know, it's again, if we can get the, the longer term investment right, if we can get the infrastructure right, if we can get it built. Um, I mean, you know, the, the takeaway COP at the end of last year now, which seems an age away. I mean, there was something there for everyone, I think, but um, you know, the, the one message I took away from it was that we need to find ways of going faster. Uh, you know, we need to collaborate better as an industry and just go faster and do what it is that we know we need to do. And uh, people like Nina have been promoting through her organisation for a long time. That was a long winded answer, Neil. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I think it's <laughs> got to the main yeah, point. Anyway. Good, good answer. Yeah, thank you. So, Christos, this is one for you now, which is about thermal energy storage more generally. It says the variability of heat demand appears to have the larger storage requirement. Can these technologies be used to store summer heat for use in the winter? And do you think heat distribution networks will be required? I know you've been thinking about this issue of seasonal thermal storage as heat and supplied as heat. Yeah. <clears throat> The, the simple answer uh, from a technical perspective is yes, but of course so th this can be done. So the advantage of all of the technologies that we've discussed is that from, from the very principles of operation, they involve heat or cold flows within the system and therefore they really play to, to this type of interaction with external sources or sinks, sinks or demands or requirements for heat and cold and or cold. Um, and let's not forget also cold cooling is becoming an increasingly important um, demand in especially the domestic sector and so on. Um, but but to, 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 to come back to the question, uh, sorry, I, I drifted there for a second, but to come back to the question. So technically the answer is yes, uh, this is a very interesting interaction and will benefit uh, these technologies greatly. But everything is economically driven um, and, <laughs> and, and, and therefore once you start playing that game, then the value of electricity and the value of heat um, compete to some extent um, and, and it becomes a very, very complicated it, it, to understand what the value of these technologies is because it's very different to different people. So it would be different to the system, it would be different to the, to the operator of the, of the technology and so on. But yes, technically the answer is yes, uh, that would be a very good idea. You can do, uh, you know, you can use the, the, the thermal stores which are part of these technologies for storage of heat as, a, as you know, just interacting with a thermal network around them. Yes. Thank you. I'll come to one for Nina. Um, will the events in Ukraine cause governments to look more closely at their current energy security? And will this encourage them to invest more in energy storage systems? Well, if people have been paying attention to the news from our fantastic Prime Minister, 
Um, he's going to be making an announcement in the next couple of days around uh, energy security for the UK. Uh, and in the conversations we've been having, and obviously um, the case making from the REA has been clearly that we need to accelerate, exactly like Darren says. You know, the, the reference price now of renewables costs of technologies, as we were discussing before we came online, Neil and you joined us, um, was against, you know, gas. Uh, gas combined cycle, um, gas turbine cost for electricity, and that and that's what's setting wholesale electricity prices at the moment, um, and of the ratcheting up of the gas prices. So we need to decouple our reliance on gas in our wholesale electricity markets in order to feel the benefit for consumers of um, of what renewables is now bringing to bear. Our market, our wholesale market, needs to be brought into question as to fully drive the right kind of investment now, to be honest. Um, in terms of the heat side of things, I hope in the announcement that Boris is going to be making, there's going to be almost like a, a mass rollout of energy efficiency for everywhere, for industry as well as people's homes. We've got six months to immunise uh, people from the vagaries of what the energy bills are going to be like from a gas price. Uh, so I think you'll everybody hopefully will agree, you know, getting renewable, dealing with energy efficiency and then getting renewables deployed is probably the best way to immunise ourselves from the uh, Russian fossil uh, a fuel a challenge that the we in the UK, but the rest of Europe and everybody else is facing too. We should not be Absolutely. feeding that war machine with funds from oil and gas. Yeah. Could I add to that as well, Neil? I mean, I hardly support those comments, but you know, there's <coughs> like related subjects like um, building standards. The way, the, way we're build, the way we are building new buildings today, you know, it is no way fit for the future. And it's back to what Christos mentioned about heat networks and, you know, heat pump technology is, is viable at the moment. It, it's amazing to me, again, as a technology manager, that, you know, heat networks were originally common in the UK in the early days of energy systems, you know, but they were all taken out as kind of coal took over as a, as a generating medium. So. You know, we have, just to support your point, Nina, we have all the technology we need to, to do this. It's the scale of action that we need. And, um, you know, I know we have announcements for future energy strategies. Um, you know, we've had those in the past. We've had 10 point yeah. plans and vision yeah. documents. You know, we actually need policy now because it's policy that drives the investment, you know, based on the investigation that Christos and his colleagues carry out. That's how we understand, you know, the, the kind of investment cases for this and the work that Stuart's doing. I think, you know, my call out would be you actually need those policies in place now. We need to do it pretty quickly. Um, if, I, if I can add, it's also about the infrastructure as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm talking to everybody here from an agriculture, low carbon energy agriculture show at the moment in Stoneleigh. And the farmers are all saying, look, we want to connect up some solar farms with batteries and other technologies and so on and so forth. But um, they've been stonewalled, being able to connect up to the grid. So there's these different, as we go back to what Krista said and what Stuart was saying, thinking differently about creating energy hubs and moving things to where the best resources are. So where are the, the caverns, salt caverns in Cheshire and other places like that? creating in, in, in that industrial location and I know we are thinking about industrializing the hubs the east coast and Liverpool and areas around like that so it's that joined up thinking and I'm proud that you know the REA we talk about it like in the hive like we've got behind me because we need it all great thanks Chris I see you've, you've answered one of the questions which is around clustering of industries and whether technologies bring any benefits if you if you co-locate energy production any storage and industrial processes yeah I'm, add I'm working my way to I'm just working my way through some of these comments which are very very interesting um so yeah there were some questions about <clears throat> yeah interactions between these technologies and external um 
sources for heat, uh, sinks for heat. Uh, of course, there needs to be a temperature compatibility. I think that's the important thing, right? So uh, there was a question about, for, uh, you know, the, uh, heavy steel, for example. Okay, so if we go to high temperature industry, that's very difficult to cater to because you, you know, in excess of a thousand degrees Celsius, that's very, it's impossible to 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 cater to that kind of demand. Uh, but some of the variants that we discussed today, they have, you know, they are storing heat at up to 500 degrees Celsius, uh, which is a, you know, a, a, a decent temperature. So that 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 covers a lot of applications, and I think that's that's an interesting thing to think about. Thank you. So uh, a, a question I think for all the panel then is, is what regulatory change is, is required to make these technologies investable? And, you know, large scale ish, long term energy storage. What, what do we need from a regulatory perspective? Uh, a lot, I would say, Neelay. Um, you know, I think still think that the regulator does a great job, you know, off -gen, you know, let's, let's be clear, they've done a great job in getting us to where we are today. Um, um, you know, and I think more could have been done in the next price review period, the, the ED2 and the T2. Um, it still feels to me, you know, this is critical national infrastructure after all, so we have to be, you know, mindful of of how important it is to the UK. Um, but, you know, I think more could have been done to um, open out the different revenue streams that the network operators could be involved in, in developing and supporting. You know, my sense is, you know, personal sense is that the the, the um, that there's not enough collaboration between the different energy vectors, the different industries, and, and I still think, uh, you know, again, I mean, it's a, it's a personal view. It still feels as though they're kind of pushing this, um, you know, to do more with less type approach that we've had to regulation, you know, through the Rio price reviews last 20 years. It's all about, you know, being more efficient, saving money. Um, you know, and I wonder how far that uh, is going to get us. You know, one of Ofgem's taglines and one of their kind of standard duties is to is to get the best bill, best value for customers. Um, you know, some of the um, some of the responses to the consultations that we've submitted, you know, have have kind of talked around. Well, you know, you may be getting the best value for customers today, um, but are you actually getting the best value for customers tomorrow? So I think they could take a broader and more longer term view toward regulation, you know, and actually come up with some clever and creative ways to, you know, to release um, the, the kind of intellectual capital that we have across all the different organisations that um, form our industry. I, I don't know if you were asking me, Neil, that question because I, we had, had the ten hour going on. I think everybody, it's, it's a question for everybody because each one of you will bring a different perspective and clearly it's the most important non-technical question, I would say. Um, well, I, I've sat on the Ofgem, the main regulator that looks after the uh, electricity infrastructure for a number of years. And I've, I mean, I'll, I'm happy to share with everybody if they're not aware, there is a plethora of funds that have just been launched now, 2022, okay? 2020, 2021, 2022. And it, but but one of the things is the right reason why we're now trying to be playing catch up is because it's only in the last two years that Ofgem actually had as part of their responsibility to deliver, you know, low carbon, net zero, before the driving force was um, look protecting the consumer, which is very very important as well. But you can do both now in terms of addressing poverty and the solutions. So there is now. Mission Innovation, 4.9 billion per year, Ofgem Strategic Innovation Fund, 450 million available between 2021 and 2026. The UK Infrastructure Bank, you know, 22 billion that's going to be available. And importantly, it's getting the message to the people who advise the government as well. The National Infrastructure Commission are condu currently conducting a consultation and reviewing what does our energy system of the future need? So there, there's a there's a lot to go at, and it's it, it takes all the efforts of uh, my team to stay on top of all of these things. But Darren and and and, and Stuart is making people aware, making sure they're aligned. And the worst thing is, is we keep bloody reinventing the wheel. Sorry, I swore. We keep reinventing the wheel and not moving things forward. So really, if there's something I want to share with the audience is, is really keep pushing and asking those 
hard questions. Why not? Why can't we? And let's get on with it and do it now. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm afraid that's all we've got time. Well, Stuart, you want a quick, a quick yeah, point? Yeah, can I just add a, a, you know, it's just building on that really. Yeah. Um, I think things are changing as, as you said, we've still got a long way to go. We should keep pushing, keep re, you know, educating. Um, you know, if you just look at an example of the pumped hydro, you know, in the UK when that was built, um, you know, it was publicly funded, you know, because that sort of infrastructure requires that vertically integrated sort of setup. Now, you know, with National Grid not being able to uh, own um, a lot of this through uh, regulatory problems, you know, is it makes it all more the more complicated. So, you know, it's removing those types of barriers. Um, it is happening. There is subsidies. We've got to get the prices down still, you know, going to that initial point that um, these are first of the kind prices and that's where the big difference is between the lithium wine guys because they're able to deploy at much smaller scale and they've brought the prices down already. So, yeah, that's that's my view. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. A fantastic list of questions there, but I, I hope we did you justice, uh, the audience. So thank you for your questions. And I'd also, of course, like to thank Christos and our panelists for an excellent session today. Um, very insightful. Anybody who wants to read further on the topic will provide a link to Christos's review paper, which is an open access paper and his IMECI article. So you'll be able to, to, to look at that. And of course, I'm sure he's happy to follow up uh, separately. So thanks again, everybody. Um, it's been a pleasure to be uh, your chair today and I wish you a good rest of the day. Thanks, everyone.